Thank you, everybody, for coming on this extremely hot British summer day. Um, so we're running a little bit late, so I'll be very brief. Uh, my name is Pablo Navaretti. I'm uh, a co-editor of Alborada, um, which is a, like a portal on Latin America that is been going for it's going to be ten years in July. Actually, we've been uh, a little bit, shall we say, we had a bit of a lull in uh, the last year or so, but we're uh, intent on picking things up as of uh, this event. So if you want to know more, go to our website, albarada.net. You can sign up to our e-newsletter. We'll be doing events in London and um, uh, across the UK and in other parts um, of the world. But basically, we, 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 look, we look to kind of offer different perspectives on issues around Latin America, media, politics, culture, because we feel that the um, current sort of mainstream narrative isn't really... Uh, up to scratch uh, when, when it comes to covering both progressive developments in Latin America, but also sort of reactionary developments. Um, but you, we've got magazine, magazines that we've produced um, uh, there for free. If you want to take a copy, and you'll get a much better idea of what we do. So stay in touch. Um, thanks for coming. Um, Natasha Josette is here um, from Level Ground. and. Also, the world transformed, which wasn't on the listing, but she'll explain what, what that is. Um, and I just want to say that I'm really, really happy that we've got uh, both Loki and Victor uh, here talking about the figure of Allende. They're both uh, friends, as is Natasha, um, uh, whose intellect and ideas I respect a lot. Um, and I think they've got a lot to give um, in terms of offering their... Um, ideas around the, ish, around the figure of Allende, who for many of us, such as myself, a uh, child of uh, political refugees, uh, my parents arrived as, I think, met some of the people in this crowd as well. Um, so Allende is a very kind of a figure that has a kind of personal resonance. But we also know, and if you've read Victor's book, you'll know that his legacy, his political legacy, is extremely uh, important. So really um, looking forward to the discussion. So I'll pass you on to Natasha. Thanks for coming and stay in touch with Alboda in the future. Thank you. Hi, my name's Natasha. I'm one of the core group organizers of the World Transform Festival. We run a four-day festival alongside Labour Party Conference every year. For art, music, culture, politics. Alborada has always been there. A um, little bit of housekeeping. If the fire alarm goes off, run or make it to the fire exit that way. Um, if you are on social media and you want to use our hashtag, please do, it's Spirit of 70. So we're gonna start off with a discussion between these two. Um, this is probably discussions that we've had around the kitchen table because I also know Vic as a godfather of my little boy. Um, so this is gonna be quite nice for me. Um, We'll also then do a three-minute video. Um, it's a speech of Allende made in 1972 at the UN, followed by a Q&A, so you'll get a chance to ask both of these people questions. Um, please keep them to questions and not long, rambling statements. I'm going to be super, super strict about it. So, to start off, Loki, hip-hop artist, Victor Figueroa. This is really weird because I have to list out all your accomplishments and not just Godfather. Author <laughs> and scholar of Latin American and Latin American left, written several papers on Chile and a book on Allende, Allende Revolutionary Democrat. Um, I'm going to start by asking you a question. What brought you to being excited by, interested in Allende? Well, I think I really read the book uh, Rogue State by William Blum uh, as a teenager at a time where I needed two core pious hypocrisies of this society exposed and ultimately discredited. And I'm going to explain what those two were. So the first one, uh, seeing that within my lifetime, uh, a country that I have roots in, that has been occupied three times over the last hundred years by the British Army, was turned into a bonanza for corporate profit and a fulcrum for sectarian war through the subterfuge of democracy promotion. 
So this was one of the pious hypocrisies of my time, was the idea that the government that represented me and also the US government were forces for um, more equal redistribution of political participation. So then reading about the story of Salvador Allende, also reading about the case of Patrice Lumumba, um, reading about the case of Mossadegh, it clearly discredited that once and for all. And then it shone really that light on the war in 2003. But it was a reality that we knew already. In terms of the other um, pious hypocrisy of this society was US exceptionalism around 9-11. So it was the idea that September the 11th was a day of pure pain for one group of people in the world. In no way does that negate the suffering of the people that died in the building or the first responders who ran and were breathing in air that they were told was safe and later died from many diseases. But it, looking at a story that had taken place in 1973, September the 11th, thousands of people um, being imprisoned, tortured, killed, also knowing uh, after reading Vic's book, actually, that preceding the coup had been uh, a campaign of terrorism, whereby, you know, at that time it was blamed on uh, left-wing groups. However, um, as Vic puts forth in the group, there seems to be uh, evidence that groups funded by the CIA had been involved in it. But moreover, looking at uh, 76, when Pinochet actually exported terrorism to the United States, and the former uh, Chilean ambassador was uh, assassinated by a car bomb in an act of terrorism by the dictatorship that was propped up by the US government at that time. So looking at those stories really discredited some of the things that were converted to commonsensical notions, really, by the powerful. Um, and, and I felt actually had quite an influence on my life. You know, I felt that I had to argue back against these arguments in, in defense of people that were being invaded who I felt akin to. So, so for me, you know, Allende was, was part of that, discovering a much, much wider <laughs> tapestry of these things. So, I mean, the way that we're gonna um, administer this conversation is, you know, I learned a lot from Vic's book um, it's quite uh, a terse read. You could probably get through it in a few days if you'd like. I'm not sure if they're being sold today, but um, if they are, pick one up or get one online. Preferably not from Amazon, but you know, if you have to, then. So <laughs> what I wanted to ask you really to start off with, Vic, is you know, we know that prior to the election which AN Day won, there were several attempts um, to arrive to power. You had a situation where 40% of the Chilean population were malnourished. You had 2% of the Chilean population um, taking almost 50% of the national income. The poorest 28% only taking 5% of the national income. We, of course, live in a country now where 50% 50 50 of the population own, um, so 1% of the population own 50% of the land. You know, the richest thousand people have seen the last 10 years, 500 billion uh, pounds uh, wealth increase. Um, what was the situation like before Allende uh, came into power through his uh, attempts? You know, we obviously know that in World War I, the uh, Allies were uh, reliant on nitrate for the development of weapons. But of course, the prices were artificially kept down so as to stop um, Chilean development. World War II, basically, it repeated itself with the copper. And also in Vietnam, you know, Chile were having to sell the copper at just around 50% of its uh, market value. So what were the conditions which created Allende? Hello. Um, Allende came to power after a long period of basically um, social, economic, um, and political crisis. Um, this was, I think, determined by Chile's place in the global economy as a dependent um, country that had been trying to industrialize since the Second World War, but under um, conditions uh, set down, um, funding conditions set down by 
the American government. Most of this investment went into light industry and consumer um, industry. This meant that Chile didn't really have an industrial base of its own, still dependent on imports and also dependent on exporting raw materials, fundamentally uh, saltpeter, uh, nitrate, sorry, and copper. Um, and so th this is the kind of the crux of the problem that Allende and other leftists in Chile seize upon, not in the 1960s, not in the 1950s, not in the 1940s, but really, you know, going back to the 1920s and 30s, and they fought against this for, you know, 30, 40 years. And um, at the end of that process, managed to get it into the minds of every Chilean that this is one of the causes of Chile's underdevelopment, Chile's economic position in this kind of global economic system. Um, and that economic crisis... Um, was reflected in the kind of social indicators that you were just talking about. Um, but it was also reflected in uh, the failure to reform political institutions. Um, by the mid-1960s, Chile um, had a, a Christian Democrat government, a, a centrist government, we might say, um, that promised Chileans uh, what they called a revolution in liberty. And the idea behind this was essentially to take the historic demands of the Chilean left and put them forward as centrist demands without the danger of what was then known as like totalitarianism or you know communist uh, authoritarianism. Um, and by 1969, that revolution in liberty had really kind of collapsed. Um, the liberty element was severely undermined by the violent repression of strikes in the copper industry, by the violent repression of um, uh, movements of people who are trying to take land to build houses on, pobladores, so the, the famous uh, massacre in the south of Chile, um, in, in Puerto Montt. Um, and so, you know, what liberty are you talking about when people are getting shot uh, for demanding uh, social or economic um, uh, improvements? Um, in An institutional crisis as well, when you look at... Um, the fact that the military, uh, a regiment of the military, rose up against the Christian Democrat government um, in the late 1960s, and um, you know, ostensibly talking about again improvements in the conditions for for the military, but really upset about um, the the program of reforms which was giving voice, even if in a very distorted and minimal way, to people in the countryside. Um, women's organisations and, and workers' organisations more generally. So you've got an institutional crisis, you've got an economic crisis, the social crisis you've described, you know, um, people's incomes over this entire period of from the 40s through to the late 60s really uh, improved very little. I think GDP per capita increased by about 1% during this period, and this is also a period characterised by quite high inflation. So, you know, for many people, conditions were actually getting worse. Um, and um, I think all, and there's also the international ferment. So there's a kind of international crisis happening as well. You've got um, the Paris in 1968, the civil rights movement in the United States, um, you know, the Soviet Union in international affairs appears to be, you know, growing stronger. All of these things are reflected within Chile and lead to uh, create fertile ground for um, the popular unity and agenda to come to power in 1970. Do you think to some extent that on the US side they may have misjudged the election in 1970? Because when you look at the amount of money from what, what I've seen, and I'm, I'm sure that you've seen far more on, on this, is the amount of money that they were spending before the election in 1970 seemed to be less than they'd spent before to try and uh, prevent an END government. Yeah, that's... I mean, anyone who's interested in the the, the funding side of uh, American efforts to undermine the agenda government um, could do... You know, you could look at the Digital National Security Archive, which is a, a website that, um, that um, uh, digitalizes... Um, uh, documentation released by the CIA and other U.S. government agencies, and um, you know there are they've produced books on this. Peter Kornblum, who leads the 
the Digital National Security Archive um, has written about this. Now, what we really see is that American um, funding for uh, anti-communism in what that's what they call it in Chile goes back to the early 1950s. And it's actually, it actually goes back even further in different forms before the CIA existed and so on. Um, and it's fundamentally directed at information. And I think that's very relevant when we're talking about Corbyn and you know the left today, how money and uh, intelligence services can create an information environment that doesn't actually reflect reality. You know, um, but we'll come to that later. Now, through the 1960s, this is very, um, the campaign becomes very aggressive and hostile. Like those of you that are, um, you know, uh, regular readers of the news here in the UK won't be surprised, you know, that every day there's something about Corbyn and it's always negative, right? You know, that he's a terrorist or that he's an anti-Semite or, you know, it, just take your pick. Well, you know, we, I think when we look at Agenda, we sometimes think, well, he won the election and then the demonization began. Now, the demonization began a long time before this, and it demonized him as an individual, but it also demonized the political parties and the ideas um, that they represented. And it went on for a significant period. Now, when um, the revolution in liberty begins to sort of totter uh, in the late 1960s, the uh, you know, intelligence services of the, of the United States decide that the money they've spent um, the most effective money they spent was on uh, the black propaganda. And, you know, that that really that's what they've got to go for. It, they've got to destroy Agenda's image. And so they go in for that very hard, um, and it doesn't work because the political moment isn't apt for it. They've been doing it for so long, I think, that it kind of um, has lost some of its effect by uh, 1970. So um, that, that's the kind of general shape of it. But then obviously we know it doesn't end in 1970. It just morphs into new forms. Um, and that's something that plays a huge role in, in what eventually happened in Chile. Do you think also there was a laying of the ground in a way by, as far as I understand, the aid that would be given to uh, the military would not be, it would not, repayment would not be demanded you had something like 1,100 Chilean soldiers that were trained on US bases during this period. So in a way, the seeds had already been laid for this, you know, and there was obviously a power struggle after the election. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, um, the United States never really um, took its eye off the ball in relation to the Chilean military um, and police, as it didn't in the whole of Latin America. Uh, the 1960s were a period when the United States um, was uh, putting a lot of money into um, the training and reorganization of intelligence services and the military and the police across Latin America. And one historian described it, I think, as um, producing over-muscled militaries against uh, really institutionally weak civil organizations. And Chile was part of that process. So, yeah, there were um, thousands of people who were being trained in the, in, um, the Panama Canal Zone and in the United States. Um, and, you know, by the time Allende comes into government, three floors of the Chilean Defense Ministry were occupied by the U.S. Military Advisory Group to Chile. You know, that, that is something I think uh, speaks volumes. So then... Uh we know that they tried to block his uh, inauguration. I know you've got so many questions, but we do have second session to go to. <laughs> okay, okay. Are we going to show the video? <laughs> no. <a> hard <laughs> I, I did say I was going to be strict. Okay. No, we're going to talk about lessons for Corbyn. Okay, just directly to lessons to, for Corbyn. Okay. <laughs> what would you reckon, Vic? Damn, we missed the coup and everything. <laughs> <laughs> do you, can you do the coup in 60 seconds? Um, I'll try. I mean, I bet I think Loki could do that better than me. <laughs> Um, I mean, essentially, what are you talking about? You're talking about an agenda government that comes in with a program of deep uh, economic, political, um, and social reforms. Also, uh, reforms that aim to change Chile's position in the international system. So uh, I think these reforms are key in provoking American hostility. The fact that Chile, uh, under agenda, recognized the governments of East Germany 
which hadn't, you know, which no no Latin American governments other than like Cuba and Mexico, I think, had recognized up until then, uh, recognized Vietnam, North Korea, China, um, and so on. You know, this breaks the American model for what Latin America, what is acceptable in Latin America. Um, on another level, you know, the economic program threatens American economic interests. Um, and uh, so th this in combination with you know, political reforms that threaten to take power away from the Chilean oligarchy, um, finally, you know, and, and therefore it's very hard to see how you would revert those reforms further down the line, um, provoke really severe hostility from the United States, which is manifested in um, a, a renewed media campaign, payments going to centrists in, or right-wingers within the centrist political parties, payments going to the media that sustain the media, uh, the dominant media at the time called El Mercurio, which was actually broke. It's sustained by CIA money. Um, and which co I would argue coordinate, bring together all of these different opposition groups in Chile and push them and nudge them until they unify, until they agree on a program, until by the late, late 1972, early 1973, they've forged a united right-wing fascistic coalition dedicated to overthrowing Allende. And that is you know, what the United States did in Chile. It also did very similar things in uh, many other places uh, since then. So I hope that kind of answers that question. A little bit more than a minute, but you know, oh, not definitely bad. more not than bad. a minute. Yeah, Just to lead on to the question about Corbyn, if possible, because I am interested in this a point you make in the book as well, is that uh, successful examples that we've had since then have been based on analyzing where things went wrong with Allende. Can you give us an example of those, the way those things have manifested in other situations, so potentially Venezuela with the military and the way it's designed that the people that are able to reach, say, a uh, colonel or lieutenant are not all from a particular strata of society. Um, what are some of those kind of uh, lessons that have been learned and then applied? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the overthrow of Allende led to a very long period of analysis by left-wingers across the world and, and definitively in, in Latin America. I think one of, one of the lessons um, that we see, for example, in Nicaragua running up uh, to the revolution there and, you know, ever since was really about unity. You know, we may disagree on, you know, um, what, what, type, what we mean by socialism or, or whatever, but let's agree on the need to achieve this step first and then that step and then the next step. Um, so, you know, to an extent, the issue of unity, and I think we can see that in Venezuela as well, where they create a unified socialist party of Venezuela um, rather than a kind of coalition. Um, and that, I think, I would argue, is actually the lesson, uh, a, a lesson that was learned here in the UK a long time ago, which is why the Labour Party is such a broad church. Um, so one of them is uh, unity of at least short-term goals um, in order to, you know, the later unity can be, you know, decided upon later. Um, the other, I think, is actually less to do with the military because in Venezuela the military was already just uh, drawn from more popular sectors of the population, unlike Chile where it's more of a caste system in the, um, in, in the officer corps at least. Um, it's to do with the integration of social movements, you know, a more dynamic coordination between social movement and institutions, political parties and government. Um, because probably that's one of the weaknesses that we can see in Agenda's government. They over, the over-reliance on the institutional, on parliamentary fighting, on agreements between political parties, and not thinking about the power that the street has, the power that the masses have to influence that context, um, which I think we can see very powerfully in Venezuela recently with these um, the tours that Maduro did of the country with the military, but also where they just held these mass demonstrations. That was also done in Chile, but I would argue that it was done in order to support a political party rather than to express... Um, support for the process as a whole. And I think, you know, that's a difficult one. But I would argue those are the two main lessons that were drawn um, in, in Latin America. In terms of the example of Corbyn, we know there are those that say uh, 
well, it's unlikely that the United States would interfere directly in something happening in the Western world or in Europe. However, we have the example of um, Gough Whitlam in Australia um, in the 70s, similar time to Allende. We also have the example of the US interfering in Italy. But uh, there is you know, another argument. They say, look at Portugal around the same time of, uh, of Allende's, uh, uh, the coup against Allende, you had a, a left-wing military coup which seemingly was not uh, prevented by the United States. Mike Pompeo has come out uh, in the last week or so and said that the if Corbyn can get past the gauntlet, which actually already implies that there's stuff being laid down that has had U.S. involvement, then the United States would take stops, uh, take steps to prevent a Corbyn government. Um, what do you think the lessons are in, in in that regard? Is it to you know like? Uh, they did in Venezuela have a, a minister for participation, have a ministry for participation. Is, is that the answer to the Labour Party today, to mm. define the, the, the reality on the ground, to build in a grassroots way so that there's pressure from the bottom up? You know, what are the kind of lessons we can take? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think uh, anyone who doubts as to whether the United States is involved or, or pays uh, a lot of attention to political processes in Britain should just look up Edward Snowden's uh, leaks. You know, if they're interested in what Angela Merkel's doing, you can bet that they're interested in what Corbyn's planning. Um, and the, the second issue that relates to that is that, you know, I, I think there's... Um, it's difficult... I, I would argue that it's difficult to draw a line between where the British intelligence services end and the American ones begin. You know, they, they are very tightly linked through the Five Eyes Network and, and other... Um, they have a long-standing cooperation agreement. Um, and, you know, to an extent, there's a transfers of, of, of you know, cadres between the two. So, you know, it, it's whether or not, you know, the British elite, uh, the, the, the deep state, mobilises some of these resources, uh, which I think I have no doubt that it would. The second issue that relates to that is that times since Agenda's time, things have somewhat changed. Um, the the security industry, the military industry, the intelligence industry has been privatized in the same way that many industries have, and that's why today we have companies like um, Blackwater or whatever. That, what's the company that's taken over from Black? That's it was renamed. I'm not sure what he's renamed it, but Bruce, Bruce Allen Cor Hamilton, for example. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So all of, the, all of these companies exist and they have contracts with governments to provide things like um, security in times of disturbance. Um, and anyone who's interested, I can talk to you about an experience that I had talking to a, a security contractor who told me about the arrangements for London in cases of uh, uh, civil disturbances here. So there is, for me, there is no doubt that um, intelligence services are paying close attention. And the, the fundamental reason is that they know that Corbyn um, is not a friend of NATO. And I think although um, the Labour Party has a position on NATO that is we will remain, it's inevitable. If you're questioning the basis of um, neoliberalism and of Britain's place in the world, if you want an ethical foreign policy for Britain, you know, that pretty much means you're questioning Britain's role in NATO. And I, I would argue that a lot of the, um, the furore around Corbyn at the moment and about his leadership of the Labour Party relates in some way to this. Foreign policy and domestic policy, um, they always uh, combine on issues such as NATO and Britain's place in the world. So I think um, there's, there would definitely be some forms of cooperation. And in, perhaps in the modern day, what we're looking at is the creation of an, an information environment around um, Labour and potentially a Labour government that would seek to um, do the same to a Labour government here as is done to Maduro in Venezuela. You know, it's a dictatorship provoking situations where the government might have to use or would be tempted to use or any normal government would use violence, um, which is what happened in Venezuela, it's what, what's happened in Bolivia, it's what's happened in Nicaragua in recent years. Why would they not do it here in the UK? There was a second part of the question that I've... Well, I mean, it was 
kind of more about the participatory side okay. is, is you know the answer building that that pressure yeah. valve for me for me the only response to this kind of thing i mean agenda gives an example of this in his life you know uh, his colleagues would say you know his collaborators would say you know but the cia if we don't do you know if we don't lock our office the cia is going to know what we're planning and he would say they already know like the the point is that we've got to mobilize people. If we can mobilize enough people around what we want to do, there's no force on earth that can stop us. So the question for any left-wing government has to be, if you can mobilize the masses around what you want to do, you will win. And I think that is exactly why the processes in Nicaragua and Venezuela have won out against vicious hostility from the United States, against terrorism, against violence, against institutional uh, subversion, you know, economic sabotage. The only way they have survived is because the vast bulk of the population supports those governments. So we're still on lessons for Corbyn. Do we take participation from uh, the audience yet, or I we don't? Okay. No, I, I defer to Natasha on this. <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> no, not okay. yet. I think you can keep going. Okay, so one of the things that I thought about was in 2015, somebody in the, obviously the Times, you know, we know, we know what the Times is embedded with in terms of the deep state. Um, they quoted an anonymous source within the military saying that if Corbyn sought to, quote unquote, emasculate the British army, that was his words, not mine, um, then they would take steps. We saw the footage of British soldiers apparently in Afghanistan um, shooting at pictures of Jeremy Corbyn. You know, what's going on there? Is this uh, psychological stuff? Is this a harbinger of things to come? You know, as you said, it's hard to know where the uh, British intelligence begins and the US intelligence ends. You know, we have around 100 military installations of the United States in this country. It's kind of seen as a completely benign and non-existent presence that's taken for granted. But, you know, what are the potential pitfalls that Corbyn... You know, how can he deal with the military, really, as an institution, in, in a way that will protect him? Well, I think the, f the first thing to note is that there is nothing in the Labour Party's programme or in Corbyn's programme... Um, that at the moment seeks to create like a, a, a socialist Britain um, directly. You know, what we're talking about is steps to democratise Britain, to democratise the economy um, and to somewhat alter Britain's place in the world to make us a more positive influence on, on the world more generally and, you know, a more humanitarian influence. Um, but the, even so, we can see the hostility um, towards this this program of reforms, um, because Britain is a vital cog in in a in a in a machine um, that is a global machine, and so I would say, you know, one of the things that would eventually have to come up as part of the democratic debate in Britain is on the as it was in Chile, in fact, um, on the role of the armed forces in the country. What are they for? Who do they defend? Because at the moment they're not your armed forces. They're not mine, they're the Queen's. And they do what the Queen, you know, constitutionally, it's Her Majesty's Armed Forces, it's Her Majesty's Intelligence Service. So, you know, I would argue, before we even get to that, we've got to have a discussion about, you know, what are politically, who are political institutions really serve? That's constitutional reform. But if you are going to get into that, I would talk about doctrine. You know, when you're talking about reform of the military, you're really talking about how you create a, a, a progressive military doctrine. And, um, you know, that is something that is, that requires a change in how you educate your military. And so in Venezuela, for example, in the 1960s, um, the military were allowed to go to civilian universities. And so they were exposed to civilian influences, civilian discussion of how you solve Venezuela's problems. Like in Britain today, you know, the, the officer corps, tends to be educated in civilian institutions and then go into the military. You know, so even, even that reform wouldn't necessarily change the doctrine. 
So that, I think there needs to be a democratic debate about what the role of the military is in Britain. And it has to go in hand with a debate around what Britain's role in the world is. Because depending on what we want our role in the world to be, that, that's the military that you need. Um, so that, that's you know, one way of, of, of looking at it. Um, and I think realistically that is uh, the only way of looking at it at the moment. Um, one of the points you made um, uh, regarding the run-up to the 1970 election was that they started to put most of their backing, kind of the 40 committee and the you know, CIA started to put most of their backing into propaganda um, against the end there. Um, can you give us some examples of, you know, because psychological warfare has developed a lot from the sort of Benazian imagining of propaganda. You know, now we're talking about uh, targeting people with their information via social media. We're talking about, you know, really quite complex and sophisticated machinery of psychological manipulation. You know, it's quite a big question, and you know, we'd be open to hear from others as well. If you could look at and, and give us some of the examples of the stuff that's been mobilized against Corbyn, and what would be a good way to build up immunity to it? What would be a good way to uh, combat it, really, in a way? Wow, that, that is a big question. And I think it's interesting because it's not, it's not just the left that's asking itself this question. You know, if you look at the discussion around fake news and the discussion around what the role of the media are and social media and whether social media need to be regulated as providers of information and so on, this is, this is something that um, uh, governments around the world are struggling with. Um, now, what, what I think is, if you, you know, if you, want, if you were worried about this or you're interested in what this information shaping might look like, Look at Edward, Edward Snowden's leaks. You know, it, those um, slides um, that he released, you know, they give a fairly good idea of, you know, what can be done. Um, but essentially what we're talking about is the application of marketing technology to intelligence in order to... So they use... Um, they have, I think, uh, there was an article recently talking about um, how there are something like 5,000 data points on pretty much any adult in the United States at the moment. And I would argue that probably for a country that's as internet penetrated and as social media penetrated as Britain, it's probably very similar here too. And those data points will tell them everything from whether you like green shoes against red shoes or, you know, which issues, you know, get you vexed or, you know, whether you like which cheese you like. They can use all of those in order to um, then uh, decide which messages would suit you as an individual. You know, um, and this is something that you know the Cambridge Analytica case points to, but also um, there are some indications that similar technology was used in Brazil to um, aid in Bolsonaro's election. And I think this is a huge challenge for the left. Um, how do we? How do you tell? How do you articulate to a population um, that their real interests are served by doing A, B, and C if they think that their big problems are D, E, and F? And that's what they're imbibing on the internet all the time. And that's effectively what we see. That's what manipulation of information is about. And we haven't even gone into you know, new doctrines on, on, on conflict, which talk about hybrid war and information war. So the boundary between overt kinetic conflict, as they call it, the application of violence, and information conflict is blurred now. You know. It's all part of one conflict. So the only way to get around that, I, I think, is mass mobilization, active, active, activating the latent membership or the latent um, support in the masses. But that requires a different kind of political party. You know, it's not the political party of going to your CLP meeting and, you know, and voting on a motion and then going home. It's a political party that is much more populist, I would say, Latin American in, it, in the way it organizes things. Um, and I think this is where Latin America has real lessons for the left in um, the developed world. And I, I, I sincerely hope that, you know, we I think we are learning these lessons a little bit. 
but maybe add a little bit more sour to the thing. I mean, that kind of leads us on to the next question, um, which I'm freestyling a little bit. But hasn't the British left abandoned Venezuela? It's just a question, man. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's a tough it's question. A tough question. Um, I mean, I, I would say there are sectors of the British left that haven't, that have always been more internationalist uh, than others. But I think it relates to the questions you were asking about like um, information and how you define what is good. And, you know, in who do you support internationally if you're going to believe, you know, the BBC and The Guardian and, you know, uh, The Times and the FT or The Economist about what's happening abroad? You know, you, you're always going to, they're always going to point to the finger at the bad, you know, the bad guy. And if you agree that that's the bad guy, then you're obviously, you know, not going to be able to express solidarity uh, properly. So in some ways it goes back to that question of having independent, autonomous sources of information. And I think one way that the British left could achieve that is by doing something that Allende tried to do, but also a lot of other socialist kind of governments in the past, Cuba, Nicaragua. It's, it's really reinforcing people-to-people -people contact through social organizations, through trade unions, for example, women's organizations. You establish those direct contacts and you've, you've got around that information barrage which is something that Nicaragua suffered in the 1980s, you know, very severely, and got around it through establishing solidarity organizations. And I would add one thing, which is that the legislation on terrorist uh, organizations was designed, I would argue, in order to prevent the development of solidarity organizations such as those that existed in the US in the 1980s around El Salvador and Nicaragua, because that really hamstrung Reagan's policy on Nicaragua. And so how did they, you know, how do you get around that? Well, you make it a terrorist defense to defend the views of an armed group somewhere else. Or, you know, some group that you have decided is beyond the pale. They're terrorists. If you defend them, you're a terrorist. And this is something that, you know, if we don't fight this, we're going to lose every battle. Because if you want to fight for peace in a, in a conflict situation, you have to say, well, both sides have a point. You have to start from a negotiating position, which is both sides have a legitimate point of view. If that, if you don't start, for, you know, and to do that, you've already got to legitimize one of the positions. And if you do that, you're a terrorist. So then what's the solution? It's always violence. So, you know, this is, it's a very complex question. Has the British left abandoned Venezuela? Mm, yes and no. A weasel answer. <laughs> Sorry for the question, man. I, mean, I would have loved to have spent a lot more time talking about Allende, but my hand was kind of forced. Um, are, we, are we Pabs? Where's Pabs? Pablo? We have yes. eight more minutes. So we have eight more minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are we going to take some stuff from the audience, or are we, are we trapped in, in Cor Corbyn? Would you want to go back and ask the question that we left out in the first session? Well, one thing that I was interested in um, was, you know, and clear from what Vic is saying, is that through the microphones and the cameras that we carry around with us, and the recent news that came out uh, regarding uh, the NSO spyware um, that Israel sold to Saudis to use in the killing of Jamal Khashoggi in Turkey, is that really with just a call from a number you don't recognize on WhatsApp, your camera can be turned on by whoever owns that spyware, or it can become a microphone to listen to what you're saying. What is absolutely clear is that our digital footprint is giving governments, at least just governments, but definitely private companies, often uh, taking money from governments to do their job, have access to information now that previously people were tortured for. And so there's less of a, a necessity to torture people. You know, the 77th Brigade, um, a part of the British Army which focuses on this idea of psychological warfare, the integrity initiative stuff that came out, has also made clear that parts of the media that we have actually kind of accept as the general ambience of, of the creation of, 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 of the manufacturing of truth in our society are actually in some way um, 
intertwined with the interest of the intelligence services. One thing that I think was really um, vital in breaking through this process was in 2017, in the run-up to the election at that time, uh, by law, the new services, as far as I understand, I'm not a lawyer, but as far as I understand, by law, they have to give equal coverage to each of the uh, candidates and each of the parties. So you were in a situation where, for the first time, Corbyn was actually being given a fair hearing in terms of time, and that led to a big change in terms of the voter intentions. The polls were literally changing in front of our eyes. So what I think would be really great is, and, and I think Vic's already made the point again and again, actually, is that we need to break this monopoly on truth. And you know, we need to be able to confidently assert that if you have a situation where 0.01% of a party's membership are accused of something, right? That doesn't qualify as a crisis. Let's stop dancing to the tunes that are being given to us by people who are not acting in good faith. And, and I think that it's realizing what are the sticks that are being used uh, to beat Corbyn. I mean, uh, we've kind of already delved into it, um, but what would you say, uh, Vic, would be a good way for us to really focus on uh, not only uh, breaking through that propaganda, but also building new narratives um, that we can, you know, in a way, tonight is part of that. Us mm -hmm. coming forward and saying, well, actually, where we can place Corbyn on is not just on a lineage, say, from the Chartists here, who for 300 years were having to uh, mobilize in, either, in order for people that don't own property to get the right to vote. You know, Corbyn is to me, a further development along that lineage of redistribution of political power. But we're also putting Corbyn in that place along a, a, a sequence of events, which is linked, obviously, to Chile, to Venezuela, um, and otherwise. What are some of the new narratives that we can uh, really paint over um, the ones that we're being given? Yeah, um, another a very good and difficult question. I mean, one of the things that um, relate to the first part of uh, what you were just talking about, um, one of the things is that, you know, we need to um, um, seize areas where we can put across a message. Um, and it, this makes me think back to, to Agenda in the run-up to the 1970 um, election, where he was, be he was being vilified um, in the media in particular for his role in um, getting the remnants of uh, Che Guevara's guerrilla uh, from Bolivia uh, out through Chile and then onto Tahiti and then France and then back to Cuba eventually. Um, he was being vilified as a kind of terrorist um, and he decided to challenge the heads of um, the major news media uh, to a televised debate and um, in this debate, he was able to take them one by one. He knew their family backgrounds. You know, this is the advantage of having been a politician for like 50 years. You know everyone down to the, you know, the colour of their socks. And he um, destroyed, destroyed their arguments in, in a televised debate that was watched by um, a large proportion of Chile's, uh, or listened to by a large proportion of Chile's population. That, that is an example of seizing terrain where, you know, you're not given it or what you're saying is being distorted. At some points, you have to take initiative. In the modern age, what, what does that mean? I think, you know, to an extent, um, young people and artists like yourself are, are showing where, um, how you can do that through social media, despite, you know, the, the double side of these social media is that they are an alternative source of information. Um, um, and in terms of narratives, I think fundamentally we've really got to identify and hone down, I think this is a collective endeavour, on what the big issues are for British people and what the, barrier, what the obstacles are to achieving those. Those obstacles become what your counter-narrative is. And I would argue here it's to do with constitution and, and the way that political life in this country is organised. You know, if we don't question...
um, at some point the structure of the British constitution. I mean, we're in a constitutional crisis already. That's what Brexit is. So, you know, and that's actually the Economist saying that, not me. Check the Economist. I think from last week, uh, it says you know the next the next big bang in Britain is the constitution. Um, you know, we need a discussion around that. Land is another issue. You know, I, I remember when I was studying for my masters, we had a an American professor. Um, and you know, in Latin America, land reform is a, has always been a big issue. And he was quoting stats at us about you know land ownership, and he said, "Well, which country is this in Latin America?" And we were all like, "Brazil, Chile, Mexico, whatever." Um, and he said, "No, it's Britain." <laughs> and you know, he's like, "You guys need a land reform." Um, so yeah, I think those are two examples, but there's you know there's many more, and I think you know we already the left in this country kind of knows what a lot of these things are. But we have to really get people to, to focus on what the, the underlying problems are, not on what comes in the day to day. Thanks, Vic. Okay. Um, with that, we're going to go to a three minute clip of ANDA in 1972 at the UN. A fines del año 72, Allende habló en las Naciones Unidas no solo para denunciar la hostilidad de Estados Unidos, sino para señalar algo mucho peor. La falta de control sobre las multinacionales y su papel nefasto era el capítulo anterior del neoliberalismo que hoy domina el mundo. Estamos frente a un verdadero conflicto frontal sobre las grandes corporaciones transnacionales y los estados. Estos aparecen interferidos en sus decisiones fundamentales, políticas, económicas y militares por organizaciones globales que no dependen de ningún estado y que en la suma de sus actividades no responden ni están fiscalizadas por ningún parlamento por ninguna institución representativa del interés colectivo. En una palabra, es toda la estructura política del mundo la que está siendo socavada. Las grandes empresas transnacionales no solo atentan contra los intereses genuinos de los países en desarrollo, sino que su acción avasalladora e incontrolada será también los países industrializados donde se asienta. Que nuestra confianza en nosotros, lo que incrementa nuestra fe en los grandes valores de la humanidad y en la certeza de que esos valores tendrán que prevalecer, no podrán ser destruidos. Right, we've got some time to take some questions from the audience. Um, can someone come and take this mic off Loki because you know how he gets? <laughs> okay, first question. Oh, someone right at the back who was first. Sorry, I'm going to make you walk up the stairs. Hiya. Um, I just want to ask you a question about mobilisation. So nowadays we're mobilising social media. Um, I have a lot of experience of this because I tried to create a Facebook group and have interactions with groups in Chile. And in fact, I get most of my information about what's happening on the ground in Latin America with Mapuche communities, etc., uh, via social media. But it feels like a losing battle because the algorithms are constantly against us. People are being shut down for supposedly showing child violence when they show an indigenous child. Um, if you subscribe to independent media like the Canary, you know you, you won't, you just don't get that information coming through. It comes through uh, days later. So 
There's this like online battle which seems to be dominated by these multinationals with these other interests. Now, my question to you would be, and it's kind of you have to stretch your imagination a little bit, but what would be the Latin American left-wing um, approach to democratizing the way that these algorithms are functioning and the way that information is being seeped and the way that, for example, there's the hundreds of Pinochet fan pages online which are completely disgusting. Um, and you make a complaint, but you know, nothing gets done. It doesn't, it doesn't go against community standards. Um, how, how could that be fixed? What would be the Latin American left-wing remedy for this dominance? Yeah, that, that's a tough question um, and a good one. I mean, it's. I think the the problem with this is that you're you're talking. It's the debate around free speech, freedom of speech, and freedom of expression. And you know, one person's freedom to express themselves is you know an insult to someone else, or um, you know, frankly, just false information. So how do you deal with that? And this is, like I said earlier on, something that is being grappled with by the World Economic Forum, you know, which is an elite uh, organ institution, by governments around the world, um, and by media organizations, you know, like the BBC, where people, you know, full-timers are engaging in how, how they grapple with this. I, I think, to, to be honest, it, it's to do with, um, and this it might sound really old-fashioned, but it's to do with nationalization. You know, nationalization of the provision of information and you know why why should social media be privately owned um you know it's essentially uh, uh, uh accruing a social product for private gain and and being valued at billions but isn't that social information isn't that social shouldn't it be a commons as some people argue um so i think um it, it would be it, Given that the Latin American countries don't produce any technology of their own, really, in this uh, at the moment, you know, one of one, of, you know, you've got two things there. One is we've got to build capacity to be able to produce these media by ourselves. And when I say by ourselves, I mean, you know, government, you know, uh, municipalities, um, and so on. So we have we actually know how to do this. And then the second one is to legislate that this information has a certain value like a raw material does, in which case it needs to be owned and distributed and, you know, um, uh, and treated as a raw material the same way as copper. So um, these are actually, you know, discussions that are happening in some places in, um, in the techie community because there's another area that we haven't really touched on here today, and that is, you know, workers' data, the data that is now being produced in the workplace, you know, through algorithms that can monitor productivity or whatever, um, you know, um, and you know that is another issue, you know. So I think there you go, two answers: nationalisation and um, you know, developing a capacity of our own to produce these types of media, which at the moment we don't have. Um, can I just also add to that? Because part of that question, when you talked about mobilisation, I think we very quickly these days go to social media in order to do that. And actually, mo social media and our phones are a tool for mobilization. It's not the be all and end all. And actually, what we really need to go is go into our communities and build power. And what you said earlier about, go about uh, basically, it's community organizing. It's relationship building in our communities. And, that's, and there aren't any algorithms for that. They can't catch you. It's two people having a conversation and forming a campaign. And I would add to that, like, like one of the reasons that social media is so important at the moment is that you've basically got, it's a form of low intensity social contact, right? It's not real social contact. And so if you replace that with real social contact, that real social contact will be preferred. But it's like social media as they exist today is the counterpart of neoliberalization and the atomization of society. So you recreate society. That's a key mission for the left, to recreate society day in and day out. And if we can do that, you know, that that's where you create your, your kind of alternative, your narrative breaking, all of that. OK, another question. Is there a woman with a, with a hand up? Yes, fantastic. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Front row just here. <laughs> 
building on what you just said and the whole thing of like community building, relationship building, recreating society. Um, you mentioned earlier, Victor, that the best lessons are to learn from Latin America. I just wanted to know both of you in your experience in the British left or observing the British left, what have been the most like standout examples for you of when that's best happened, whether intentionally or not um, learning from Latin America, but what are the most standout examples you guys have both seen, and you as well, please, cause like of, of um, when that's really worked really well. two spaces to think about it, if you two can answer it first, if possible. So was that about kind of community organizing over other kinds of organizing? Were, were you not talking about specifically the lessons from Latin America being applied in the British context? Yeah, but not necessarily yeah. intentionally, because when you guys, when you say that's what, when you say that's what we should look to, we should be learning from Latin America, not necessarily that a particular social movement has intent, like intentionally done that, but what stands out to you is if well, that's ever for happened. Me, I mean, I, I think you know you, you mentioned Grenfell earlier on. You know that if you look at what, what's happened with the mothers that disappeared in, in in Latin American countries, it's a very similar type of organisation commemoration that becomes a locus for like demands. And so I would say for me in the last few years, that's probably one of the most important um, you know, examples of where Latin American style uh, mobilization has taken place. Um, okay, I am going to give an example um, that is relevant to a young woman in the audience right now. And she probably knows who she is already. Her name's Beth, she's in the back there. Um, and she's one of the Labour Party community organising units. So the Labour Party is already putting quite a lot of resources into doing exactly what we've been talking about here. Um, possibly you could say learning from the Latin American left. Um, so Beth has been working in an area called Putney um, and came across... Beth, would you like to tell this story? Are you sure? <laughs> I can get a mic up there. Okay. Um, you can fill in the details then. So there's a so when we're talking about like who the real baddies are, this particular baddie is A2 Dominion, it's a housing association in Putney, who had basically uh, it was a house in Putney it was managed decline situation. There was mould everywhere. It was really kind of a Grenfell strike too, and the residents had spent quite a lot of time trying to. Uh, have it solved, talk to the residents association, trying to form a residents association and kind of not really getting anywhere until Beth came along. And with kind of being able to mobilize, build relationships with people in the housing association, they now have a tenants association. They've even been able to go into their local CLP and train the CLP on how to do mobilizing. And this is, Working class, lots of single mums. There are dis people who are disabled who couldn't get up the lifts in their building. You know, this is really about bringing true power back into the community. And actually, maybe quite a lot of those people didn't even know that Beth was from the Labour Party, but they do now eventually. Maybe they weren't all members, but I could pretty much guarantee they'll all be voting in the next election. They'll vote Labour because they know that when Beth was there, she was there for them, with them. That's the best example I can think of. Well, I think um, one point leading on from that, which is quite interesting, what has happened in the community following Grenfell is there's been several victories which are not actually emphasized, certainly not by the mainstream media, but even, even by kind of others. You know, the library, we... Uh, pressured the council into signing a, a, a memorandum that it would be permanently a public asset. That for several years prior to the fire was, uh, you know, there was the well-known footage of people running into um, RBKC, into the council's building following the Grenfell fire. But what I remember the first time I ever saw that happening, it was because the library was going to be uh, leased to the private school next door to it. So the community mobilized in a major way. The council was seen as unreactive. 
What I'm also interested about is that when we're looking at this unreactive local power, and we're looking at cuts that have killed 130,000 people, it seems, or led to 130,000 preventable deaths across the last uh, 10, eight to 10 years, the hands that are cutting them on a local level are Labour Party hands in London. And so that process that is playing out is really vital. And, and, and really the soul of local Labour parties are being battled over. And it is a struggle between what is really grassroots and what still seems, unfortunately, to be adherence to that neoliberal logic which has led to sub such suffering. One point that uh, Paul Gilroy made following Grenfell, a criticism of his, was that there has been, and it's one of the things that Chavez did well, um, was speaking about Grenfell as an example of something. Grenfell is an example of how neoliberalism kills people. That point needs to be made again and again, and it needs to be made clearly by Labour's leadership as well, in order for people to start to put together and connect those dots and see how what seems to be quite an abstract uh, theory or a buzzword that people don't necessarily have a ready-made definition to, they can say, you know, Gordon Brown, of all people, came out and said, well, the neoliberal consensus is dead. If the neoliberal consensus is dead, then let's make sure that Grenfell is its tombstone. You know? It, the, the point has to be absolutely clear that the stakes are, you know, we're talking about 200,000 people in this country that are exposed to uh, this same arconic cladding, massive US construction company, six millimeters of polyethylene, it's a done deal. And it could happen at any time. You know, and, but also an important part of this is it's also on student accommodation. You know, you've got the children of the global elite studying in London. They could be staying in accommodation that actually has that on also. You know, you've got numerous leaseholders now being told they have to pay £30,000 or £40,000 to get this stuff removed off of their buildings. You know, it's even believed to be on some army barracks as well. Cinemas, hospitals, schools. This is a national scandal and a national crisis, which frankly, yes, it begins with Michael Heseltine in 1984. He specifically said the Building Regulations Act will allow for industry self-regulation, but it does end with approved document B under a new Labour government. You know, these points need to be made and these battles need to be waged because the soul is, is, is a contested space. The soul of the Labour Party is a contested space. No, you, you're looking behind you. Yeah. Hi there. Um, when I ended, he won in 1970. He won with a small plurality. Was it 36, 37% of the vote? What did he do immediately after that to try to consolidate his power, reach out to wider layers, and what are the lessons for Corbyn from that? Yeah, I mean, I think it was 36.9. Um, but... The, the programme of the Popular Unity was echoed by the programme of the Christian Democrat government, uh, Party going into that election. So the argument that I make in the book um, and that has been made by others before me is that, you know, the effective support for Agenda's programme is actually up there, you know, in 70-odd percent. Um, so I think, you know, what did Agenda do to try and um, strengthen his, his base, as it were, or the base, the social base for the popular unity. Um, well, he tried to build cooperation with the social base of the Christian Democrats, fundamentally. You know, he tried to nominate Christian Democrat ministers. He tried to um, uh, incorporate them in the celebrations of his government victory. Um, and I think he was relatively successful in his first few months. You know, the, the nationalization of copper was voted for unanimously in uh, Chilean Congress. I think that's, that's not an expression, that's an expression of two things. One is how far they won the battle over whether nationalization was necessary to Chile's future. 
And the second is that it, they created such a, a political reality on the ground with the mobilization that had gone into the elections and so on, uh, that there was no way that even the right could uh, oppose it and survive. Um, you know, afterwards, it, it dissipated. But fundamentally, you know, how does Agenda build uh, mass support? By trying to be as um, uh, as inclusive as possible, you know, uh, and I think that he does that very successfully, actually, even though it ends in his ultimate uh, defeat. Um, can I ask a question at this point, Vic? Um, do you think that it possibly could have been avoided or prevented what happened to Allende? Do you think there were certain decisions that he could have made at decisive points that could have avoided it? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is something I've thought about uh, quite a lot, and it's a really good question. I think there are undoubtedly things that he uh, perhaps could have done, but when you look at who he was and his political trajectory and what his fundamental beliefs and core values were, you know, there's a reason the book is the, my book is called Revolutionary Democrat. He is a Democrat down to the marrow of his bones. Like, he can't conceive of another way of doing things. And I, I think this is his Achilles heel, because what he needed to do was go over the heads of the popular unity parties and actually use his powers as president in order to call um, a referendum when it would have been politically uh, um, advantageous to do that, you know, either in 1971. Or, you know, there were multiple occasions when he could have done it, but he wouldn't do it because he was very wary of the Latin American tradition of the caudillo, the, the kind of charismatic leader who, you know, uses mass organizations to get power and then dumps them, you know. And he was adamant from the 1940s onwards that he was not a caudillo, even though in some ways he was because he was a charismatic leader. So what could he have done? My, in my view, it would have been to say to the popular unity leaders, I know that when I, when I became your president, I said that we would decide everything collectively, but you guys can't agree on anything. So I'm doing this. And the people would have gone with him, I, I think. Yeah, because they did, you know, whenever, before. Okay, I'm gonna sneak one last question, but make sure it's definitely a question and not a statement. All right, who, who's that at the back with the hand up? Oh, oh, I know you. <laughs> I know that face. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm possibly going to show my age here, but I, I just one more small thing. Agenda did have 30, won the elections with 36% of the vote, but two years after, there was another election, and he increased the percentage to 43%. So two years into his government, by the implementation of policies that were really favoring the working class, the people that he had uh, pledged to, to defend, he was actually, he had actually increased the support. And among those include myself. I was at the time one of those people that got converted by agenda, by the policies he was implementing favoring the class that I thought was my class. That's one comment that I wanted to make. And also I must say by the visit of Fidel Castro to Chile who had a huge influence as well on, on not only on Allende and at, the time, at that time, but the Cuban Revolution and Fidel Castro visit, who you couldn't stop listening to the speeches that he was giving in the national stadiums and everywhere he went. And I think I know many people that will remember that. But going back to the issue of mobilization, I think that during the Allende government there was mobilization. We mustn't forget that there was mobilization in the industries, in the fabrics, in the Los Cordones Populares, these huge organizations where the workers were being, were organizing, and you will probably see in, in one of the films that it was shown earlier on, there, were there was mobilization in the, in the, in the poblaciones where, we, where people lived, the, 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 the neighbor janta where people were organized in order to distribute the, the little food that was available because of the shortage, because of the, 
the, the, the, the, the, the, the food that was being eaten by the, by the owners and the, the big industrialists. There was mobilization at the universities. And the, so there, the, 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 there was, by the students, by the peasants, so there was mobilization. Um, but that wasn't sufficient. And I think that's, I wanted to, 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 to bring that to one of the things of the, of, of, of the lessons, because we are talking about here about the mobilization that we can do in this country. And I think it's great examples that you are given uh, with the, our local libraries, with the Grenfell Tower, and we, with any other building or housing issues here. But if we don't have the tools to be able to really change something with that mobilization. And I think that's why if we don't manage to get authorities, the government that is all going to able to help us to implement the things that we want to achieve with the mobilization, to stop the austerity policies that are killing people in this country, I think um, I am a little bit pessimist in that. I think we need more than that. We need to do that, but also to make sure that we, are, we somehow are able to get rid of the Tory government and, and of these austerity policies, and we're able to bring Jeremy Corbyn into power and, 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 and with, uh, with, him, with him a government that will allow us and will support us in, 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 in making sure that we can change the things that we want to change with our mobilizations, because otherwise, I'm afraid we, we, are, we may be left in the cold still. I mean, we, we, we may really be less, but at the end of the day, the council will not have money they, 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 for, for that. They, they, they will not give them the funding for, for whatever we want to fight for in the library is my best example. So we mustn't forget that it's at two levels. I mean, we, we, we have to mobilize locally, definitely, and as much as we can, but we also have to make sure that we can get rid of this government, because otherwise we're going to be really not as effective as we would like to be. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid there isn't any more time for any more questions, um, but I would like to say a really big thank you to all of you for coming here today, and a big thank you to Loki and Victor for really digging deep into history and the lessons of Allende. Um, but before we all go to have a drink with our comrades, I just wanted to take an opportunity to, for us to remember that actually what we have today is an amazing opportunity. Um, and it's really, as we've heard today, often hard to see when every day the mainstream media tell us that the country is divided. Years of Tory austerity have resulted in deepening of inequality, rising child poverty, the dismantling of the trade union movement, rise in the far right, and an increasing sense of powerlessness across the country from Grenfell to Brexit. And while we're distracted by Brexit and the press push toxic stories of both a divided country and a divided Labour Party, corporate powers are pushing for Britain to become a low-wage, low-tax island, whatever the Brexit outcome is. But we have a Corbyn-led Socialist Labour Party. We can bring people back into the heart of democracy. And to me, it is no surprise that I learned this lesson from the Chilean community. It's a complete coincidence that I happen to be part of the Chilean community because actually it was one day in my first day of Sixth Form College and I went to sit down in my English literature class feeling quite nervous. And this girl came and sat next to me who happened to be Chilean, and we became really close friends. It was the first day of many, many, many years of friendship. She is also godmother to my son. Um, and I think it is really through her and through her family that I learned about Allende, shared many family experiences, because I too come from a family of political exiles. And a lifelong friendship started that day. Today, this friendship is deepened by love, revolution, and solidarity. So let's embed those lessons that we can learn. And what we have learned of the unbroken spirit of the Chilean people. Let's embed it into our politics, our activism, our families. Because we are not in government yet, but we will be.
And we don't have to wait for a general, general election to fight for our communities and to win. And that's what I'm taking away from today. Thank you. Have a drink. <laughs>